What's happening, good people? Welcome to another episode of First Generation Wealth Builders. Hey, this episode is going to be a little different here. <laughs> so this episode is going to be about dating. You know what I mean? So I got my girl Ginger in the building, man, from Atlanta. What's happening? What's up, Eric? Thank you for having me. Man, no, thank you for coming on to the podcast and blessing us with the word. <laughs> so for those who don't know, mm-hmm. who is Ginger Dean? Well, my name is Ginger Dean. I'm a psychotherapist, and my specialty is helping women heal after toxic relationships. And to that end, I started a business, and it's called Loving Me After We. Gotcha. You help them afterwards. Why won't you be reaching out to the women before so they don't get in them toxic relationships? Because that's where I'm at. Because everybody's not on the same boat when they get started. Mm. Were you trying to say that woman just, we were born evil and No, nope, I'm not saying that. <laughs> like, do not let her, like, point at me. All right. So, we was we was just chopping it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and you are a psychotherapist that help people heal after relationships. What, what type of people come to you for help? I would say it's typically the children. Well, I'm sorry. Typically women and also men who have experienced childhood trauma. They're typically the children of narcissistic parents or they're the partners of narcissists, right? Or what we called, you know, chronically immature people, right? So those people could be their parents or their partners. I like that. I'm going to start using that, uh, Jackson. Chronically immature. <laughs> like, you're chronically immature. I feel like I'm going to use this in this, po- in this podcast against you, though, but it's okay. We, <laughs> you're being chronically immature. Yes, chronically immature parents and or partners. Yeah. Got you. All right. And so when they're in distress, um, how do they contact you? Um, it depends. Usually it's via DM, not really so much via email or in the comments. Like I'll see comments about like, yeah, you know, I've been through this. I'm going through a breakup right now. And, you know, they end up on my Instagram page, loving me after we. And so because people are always researching someone else's behavior and they don't realize that that's often the first red flag is if you're researching someone's behavior at 2 a.m. in the morning, because that's where I get a lot of my comments, that's when you have to kind of say to yourself, wait a minute, something is wrong here and maybe I need to look at this a little bit deeper. They try to figure the other person out. They try to come back with like, okay, if I'm being gaslit, then, you know, what's a comeback that I can use instead of just saying, this just isn't healthy. Let me just take a step back. Right. Mm. So how I usually, how they usually come to me is because they're searching different hashtags on Instagram at two o'clock in the morning. Got you. Wow. So two o'clock in the morning, huh? Mm-hmm. Like you don't get them like in the daytime? Of course we get them in the daytime, but I wake up to more DMs overnight than I do during the daytime because their friends send them uh, my Instagram posts. They may see the post on Facebook and it it leads them back to Instagram. Um, However they find me, they end up in the comments or they end up in my DMs. And that's pretty much like where it starts usually. Because I usually hear, oh, my friends sent me your Instagram posts. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Got you. You certified? What do you mean certified? You got a degree in this? Yeah, I got two master's degrees in this. I don't, but we're going to talk about two today. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. So tell me about yourself. Where are you from? I am originally from Jamaica, so I'm Jamaican. Gotcha. And I yeah, was, man. Yes, man. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. See, you don't be tall. You don't be representing your roots when we be at Masterminds. I do. Yes, we do. It's from now me on, and if, at least three other people in our mess. From now on, when Jamaican. we get turned up, I need to hear your yaman. You can't hear that, but it, okay, we'll, hear, we'll see. All right. <laughs> well, from Jamaica, though, keep going. So, yes, I'm Jamaican. I was raised in New York, right, and then came down to D.C. for grad school and then recently moved to Atlanta. Where where'd you go to school in D.C.? I went to I went between George Washington and then over to Marymount University. Gotcha. You might be a little smart then. I'm plenty smart. Okay, yeah, okay, that's what's up. <laughs> All right. So, what was what was your major? In, in, in uh, so I g- ended up graduating with uh, dual master's degrees in forensic psychology and also counseling psychology. Got you. All right. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you apply that to your current um, coaching, and or you applied more of your personal experiences? 
I would say it's a combination, right? Mm. So in working in forensics, you're working with the interfaces between psychology and the law. So to that extent, I've worked on capital murder cases um, where we've had to, in, in, you know, like interview the victim's um, family members. Then you kind of get a sense of how people grew up, grew up to take them to that point, right? Um, then also I worked in foster care where there's a lot of legalities involved in mm. foster care where, you know, as a therapist, you're doing work with, for example, the biological parent and also the foster parent mm. then there's like the collective family therapy as well with regards to self-counseling psychology it just helps you understand how to bring all of that together for example so one thing i talk a lot about is attachment trauma right and how when we experience childhood trauma as children it now translates into how we relate to others as adults mm. so can you give I, me an example so if I had an emotionally neglectful parent, right, who was kind of like, you know, maybe, yeah, you had food on a table, clothes on your back, a roof over your head, but they weren't necessarily attuned to your needs. They were around, but they weren't present and validating. You didn't necessarily feel seen or heard growing up. And a lot of us normalize that, but we don't really realize it until we get into adult relationships and we realize that we have anxious attachment. So what happens is as adults, then if you're the child that suffered emotional neglect growing up, sex might be the only way that you know how to connect to someone else because you have that person's undivided attention. You have that person caring for you in that moment. The love bombing that happens, the lead up to all of that. Hold on, hold on. What's love bombing? Love bombing is the excessive care and attention that's shown to someone in such a way that it becomes overwhelming. So you meet someone and you guys are talking on the phone. We were just talking about this on the live last night. You're talking on the phone 12 hours a day. You're texting throughout the day. Y'all are seeing each other all the time and it's not sustainable. So what happens is that person eventually drops off. Off, they ghost you or they fall back and they get avoided and the other person's like but, but wait what happened I need all this attention but that's not sustainable so with love bombing it almost feels just really superficial it feels really glib because it's not necessarily genuine it's related to what we call a hyper activated reward system so kind of like the bright shiny object Man, hold on boy you going hyperactive hyperactivated reward system. Define that. So hyperactivated reward system is essentially like when someone was emotionally neglected as a child, they often had to chase their parent for attention. So when they finally secured that attention, they felt loved, they felt seen, they felt heard, right? With love bombing as adults, they're essentially doing the same thing. They're chasing you, but once they have you, it's kind of like, okay, thank you, and they move on. So mm. you'll hear from, because a lot of the women who um, who follow me are in heterosexual relationships. So like they'll say, well, you know, well, after I like, you know, had sex with him or like, you know, after I like I agreed to be in a relationship, it was like, boop, the person disappeared. Or, boop, they just kind of stopped doing what they were doing. And that's just because of the hyperactivated reward system. You know, when you're working towards a goal mm -mm. and you're like. I'll give you a better example. <laughs> Is it like this? I'm so sorry I had to interrupt you. Is it like when. Everything is perfect. Y'all finally get married and she she just act totally different. Or he acts different. Yes. Oh, you got to re represent them, huh? <laughs> uh, I, yes. Gotta, okay. Uh, thank you for agreeing with me. Okay. It, it can. I think that's a surface example. With a hyper-activated reward system, you got to focus on the word hyper. Like okay. it's very intense. Mm. So think of it as like um, the Olympics and you're running towards a goal. Like you're literally sprinting towards a goal. It's very intense. So that's why I love bombing. It feels so good because you're like, oh my God, this is all the attention that I wanted to have growing up that I did not have. You're not necessarily articulating in that way, but it feels good. So when we're chasing something constantly and now we finally have it and you're like, oh shit, I can't get enough of this. And you're just like, I want more. That's what it feels like. I want to say inappropriate things. Like? You said when you're getting something like, you know what I mean? But I ain't going to go there. You're all right. I'm going to keep it clean, man. First generation wealth builders, we focus on throw people what they do and their connection to real estate. Not not, not, not that stuff. All right. Let's get back to you. All right. So the, the hyperfixation, though, can you give me some examples? Um, I mean, you're you're giving me examples of the the Olympics, right? Running to work towards the ultimate goal but like you know what what really happens out here now like what what does a man or a woman do mm -hmm. that 
that you could give cue to the, the audience that like, man, I need to look out for that because that could be happening to me right now. So for for a woman, it's typically the people pleasing, auditioning and performing that they don't necessarily look at as love bombing. They'll say well, only men love bomb. And I'll be like, y'all do it, too, because you people please. You go over there, for example, and start cooking, cleaning, playing chauffeur, um, paying bills. Um, cleaning house, doing all these, you know, what I like to say, like the help stuff, because you want to prove yourself that you're good enough, right? Because you're activated now. And you're like, oh my God, I have to be chosen. They have to want me, right? And you're doing all these things. And then if it doesn't result in a relationship, then you're upset later on. Same thing with the guy. The guy may be taking you out on dates and taking you out on trips, buying you jewelry, doing all these things. And it feels like, oh my, it feels overwhelming. It feels like a lot, but we've normalized it because we're just like, well, they're supposed to do all these different things. They don't really know you, right? So why do you think they're really doing it? What's their underlying drive for doing this? And oftentimes they don't even realize why they're doing it. No one really realizes why they're doing what they're doing when they're doing it. They're just doing it. And so we've normalized it so much where we just say, well, you know, on the first date, you should, I saw this meme on the, I think it was a Facebook group. Somebody said, well, on the first date, he should buy me a dress so for me to go out on a first date with him. How old was she? I don't know. She looked like she was in her 20s. Like, yeah. And I was like, what? Yeah, he should buy me a dress, get my nails done. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, on the, for the first date. So sometimes I have to ask myself, do people really want genuine, authentic, connected relationships or do they want transactional relationships where, do you get what I'm saying? Like you buy me a dress, you get my nails done. And one of the things that I learned from my audience, honestly, this year was that when they used to be engaged in that behavior, they felt really obligated to have sex later on. Later on. So that's what you're referring to as a transactional relationship. Mm-hmm. I, I buy you... Nice dinner, trips, I get some ass. Essentially. Got yeah. you. Can you give flip it in reverse for a woman? What, what, what does a woman do in a transactional example? What do you mean? Meaning like I buy as a man mm-hmm. trips, food, hair done. In exchange for that, what, what's an example of what a woman does when they're love bombing? In a transactional way like that, the auditioning, the performing, okay. the I'm I'm cooking your I'm cooking your food, I'm doing your laundry, I'm taking your kids to school, anything that you want me to do, and it's usually stuff that ends up making them look like the help around the house. Got you. Also, because they tend to these women tend to date people who are men who we call Peter Pan types, right? They don't really have much direction going on in their life. So they get to play mommy to these guys. Mm. They get to, again, do their laundry, pay their bills, do all these different things for them, you know, build them up because there's a running joke with them in the comments that, oh, this is a -a Build-A-Bob moment, right? Where they're looking to build someone up in order to maintain control of them. The flip side is men have done that too. So this is what we call an imbalanced power dynamic where you meet someone and and this is why I'm a, this is why I'm a huge fan of this shit is going 100 miles an hour bro <laughs> like like man hold down no keep going don't let me stop you right now cuz it's interesting mm-hmm. keep going so this is what I call an imbalanced power dynamic right so if there's an imbalanced power dynamic you as a woman you don't really have much going on for yourself right mm-hmm. but you're dating someone with money there's nothing wrong with wanting someone who has money who's a provider or a protector type Nothing wrong with that. So don't write me and email me all pissy and whatnot. There's nothing wrong with hey, that. Hey, y'all can follow her at Ginger Dean on Instagram. DM her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep Do going. Not DM me. Yo, I your energy is bad right now. Okay. Your energy is bad. Let's get back to the good energy. You was teaching. So, me. like I was saying. Yeah. So an imbalanced power dynamic, right? What's going to happen is someone has more power in the dynamic than the other person, right? So... How people try to manage that with is with sex and money. With you know, women say, if you want to have sex with me, you're gonna give me money. And men are like, Well, if you're gonna if you want this money, you're gonna have sex with me. That's what we call transactional relationships. Mm-hmm. So whether it's the guy or the girl, depending on like what's going on, that's what they're often bartering and trading with each other. Mm. So we don't in today's society, it just it can often feel like, well, these relationships are transactional. They're not necessarily authentic and connected. No one's really doing their own inner work. No one's looking and saying, well, like a lot of women will say, and how I know this is because 
there's this conf- a woman will say in the comments and in my DMs, there's this conflation between sugaring, right, and wanting to be in a relationship and femininity, for example. And so a lot of them will get burned in these relationships because their activated attachment wounds still show up later on. So they'll find someone who is the daddy that they never had, but they'll also say to me, yeah, my father never paid child support. So therefore, I wanted to find a man who was wealthy, who was well-to-do, who could pay the bills. But they do that to the exclusion of whether or not this person is emotionally healthy. So then they find themselves in a position where, because this guy already knows there's an imbalanced power dynamic. That's why he's dating you. You don't realize it. All your little inner, all your eyes see is through your inner little girl lens that says, oh, he's rich like my daddy was. I want to be with this person. Never realizing that you're probably also choosing someone who's not going to be there for you emotionally like your father wasn't because he wasn't around financially um, or emotionally. Mm. Woo! <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, so you ready? Yes. <laughs> have you have you ever been in a situation where you've been love-bombed? Absolutely. Got gotcha. you. Men what, try to love-bomb me all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, 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 how do you combat that? You set boundaries. And you kind of, you try to slow it down because you want that situation to be kind of like a slow candle burn, a fireplace fire, not a raging forest fire, right? So if we allow the ra- the raging forest fire to take place, then you're just going to get burned at some point. But if so, you- so, so, so let's break that down. Mm-hmm. I need to, I need you to use terms that I can understand. So if the guy wants to see you four or five times a week. That happens a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing is we're moving the pace really fast so that we can feel like we have this false sense of intimacy when we really don't. So I've known you over the course of two weeks and I've probably seen you eight or nine times. That's a lot because at that point, you don't really know the person that well. It feels like you know the person well because you're talking to them and you're seeing them a lot. But there's usually a lot of love, love bombing that's happening during that time. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I get the frequent visits and, and in-person mm-hmm. uh, interaction. What else is happening during that time that, 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 that causes what you call the rainforest situation? Well, you're having a lot of bonding that's happening. Sex, you know, like the, the emotional bonding that we talk about that happens with sex doesn't only happen within the bounds of sex. It happens when you're just spending a lot of time together. You're hugging, you're kissing, you're um, laughing, you're playing around with each other. I don't do but, that. I send nudes. I hope you don't send nudes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? I try to break the ice out the gate. I hope you, I you hope. know what I'm saying? I feel like it's a, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a good call to action. No. We're talking about sales. <laughs> <laughs> Women don't watch your dudes, man. I mean, I'm just saying. Like, and then dudes want flowers. Like, you know what I'm saying? Flowers are nudes to us. Like, they're priceless. Like, that's what I call flowers. Or send me some flowers. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, man, my audience is getting to know me a little bit more. It's a more intimate setting right here. It's different. It's not all business. Like, so, um, but yeah, like, so... Mm-hmm. We got that piece. All right. So you said, though, slow it down like a candle, like a slow burning candle. Mm-hmm. You said set boundaries. I'm going to bring you back to that because mm-hmm. I asked, what, what can you do? You said set boundaries. Mm-hmm. Can you give me, a, a you know, some examples of how you set boundaries? You might say, you know, so let's just say you've seen each other on Sunday. They want to... So we want to see you on Tuesday and they're like, yeah, so can we set a date for like, you know, let's go away this weekend, for example, from Friday through Monday. Right. And then this happens. This this totally happens. I did that before. Yeah. So I'm trying to smash. First so week. I did it before. Okay. So the first week, y'all are going away together and y'all don't even know each other. Y'all haven't really spent time together at all. Right. Getting to know each other is literally the first week. You might say to the person, well, you know, I'd love to love for us to spend more time together. But, you know, can we just like do it in a setting that doesn't require us to like go away together? Can we slow down the pace a little bit? I love talking to you. I love that, you know, you want to get to know me and I want to get to know you, too. But I kind of want to just make sure that we're doing it at a pace that, you know, feels really safe for both of us. That's, that's the pace I'm on now. I just be like, I'm cool. Hold mm-hmm. on real quick. Let's go to the park. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> let's go. Let me, let's go on a walk so I can hear how intelligent you are first before we go on any trip. Yeah. 
but, but really, I, I really believe that we've lost the art of just truly getting to know each other as people, right? As friends and building that foundation before you just kind of jump into something. Why do you think we lost that art? Because I just think in the media, we romanticize these fast paced Um, these fast burning relationships, right? Women, like for instance, and I know some people are going to disagree with me on this because it's not, (laughs) okay. So it's not always the, people want to be the rule, but don't realize that their friend's stories are really just the exceptions. So the whole, Mm -hmm. a man knows when he first looks at you, whether or not you're his wife. Mm -hmm. So they almost expect the same way. And this is where the story goes back to. The connection is back to when you're first born and your parent sees you, right? And they're like, oh my God, I love you. You're so sweet. They want that same, like the first day he meets you to basically say, okay, you're my wife. Let's go get married. Let's go to the church. And a lot of women are just disappointed if like literally they'll say to me my DMs, well, it's been three weeks and I don't know whether or not we're going to be exclusive yet. Y'all, you don't even know this person. Their representative is still here. There's a running there's a running joke in my Facebook group where we say it's about 10 to 16 weeks where you get to know somebody and really start to really spend time with them and get to know who they are. And that's when you see the real version of who they are. Not necessarily that it has to be like a Jekyll Hyde situation, but you just want to get to know who you're dealing with. Mm. But so many of us are like, well, after two weeks, I want to know whether or not I'm going to be your girlfriend. So what's up? Let me be honest. Mm-hmm. Do you... I'm going to ask you. Mm-hmm. Do you really think most people wait three months before sex? I don't think most people wait three months before sex, but I think it would behoove them to give themselves the time to be able to get to know the person well enough before sex. I don't believe in 90-day rules or anything like that. I think everyone has to do what works for them, okay. right? But I do think that we we live in this culture of like, okay, it's been two dates, let's go have sex now. We were just talking about this on the live last night, too. I wish you were there. But see, you, you messaged I was me. On the, I was on the airplane. I, oh, I seen okay. you on the, I seen oh, you. Okay. I was on the airplane. I, could, <laughs> I couldn't chime in. It could be toxic a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Got you. All I right. don't think everybody is going to do that. But what I suggest that for once we try getting to know someone before we jump into bed with them, absolutely. Because... As we're debating right now on my page, attachment activated attachment wounds are real. And when you don't know who you're choosing, some of us are choosing people who are literally subconscious replicas of the parents who abused us over and over and over again. Mm. And we don't realize that. So when you've done your own inner work, you can say to yourself, well, hmm, this person's giving me daddy stuff right now. So maybe I need to st- fall back and take a minute and really think to myself here, how much does this behavior mirror something else I've experienced in my life? Even if you're not really clear on what happened to you when you were growing up, you just know that you are familiar with people who drop off for three weeks, come back in for five days, have sex with you, drop off again, come back in, and it's a it's a circular pattern. And so you kind of have to say to yourself, well, this is not really what I want anymore. So how do I jump off of this merry-go-round? No one really asked that question because they're too caught up in the hyperactivated reward system. They're caught up in all the oxytocin, the dopamine, the adrenaline, the endorphins that are running through us whenever we're interacting with someone and we're not really taking the time to get to know them. So sex is involved. We're spending copious amount of time together. There's nothing wrong with sex in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with spending time with each other, but there's no time really by ourselves in that process to really say to ourselves, do I like this person? Like, what's really going on right now? They cursed out their baby mama in front of me or called her a bitch and a hoe and she was all these other different things. And I also realized that they're still talking to their ex, that they said they broke up with six months ago, but they actually just slept together two weeks ago. Do I really want to continue? And some people just decide to continue anyway because they're just kind of like, I'm too caught up in the situation to be able to turn back now. Mm. What's the first step into somebody loving themselves, you think? So a lot of people struggle with the idea of self-love. So I say, let's try self-respect, right? Because just, oh, I love myself. It feels too cringeworthy for some people. Um, So I say, you know what? 
I'm going to set this boundary because I respect myself enough to set this boundary with this person. I may struggle with loving myself, the idea of loving myself, but I would say let's start with self-respect, right? So if I if you wanted me to respect you, what would that look like? I would probably need to have boundaries with you and not disrespect you. So if you have someone, for example, if every time you say, um, you know, I want us to spend more time together, you know, and the other person responds and said, you so fucking needy. I can't stand your dumb ass, right? If I respect myself, I'm going to say, you know what? Talking to me like that is just not what's going to work. So mm. I'm going to just back up off of this right now. So I would say the first step is self-respect. When you continue to make decisions that honor the person that you're becoming, you get on the path towards self-love. But it's often going to be through, at the very least, through you learning to respect yourself and, and honor your boundaries. Got it, too. What are some tools or some exercises that, one, listening... And then mm-hmm. that is on the struggle bus could apply. So one of the tools that we use within the Loving Me After We Inner Circle membership is the life timeline. Um, it is a very involved exercise. So we tell people to kind of go slow with it. It helps them pinpoint stuff that's happened in their past to what's going on today in the present. So, for example, in my own um, in my own example, one of the things I would look at, I would say to my therapist at the time was, well, you know, he's so even keeled because I used to be really attracted to men who who were like even keeled and calm, right? And so she would say to me, every time you tell me about a new guy, you always lead with the fact that they're even keeled. What's the connection you have with that to your past? And I was like, well, my dad was like six foot four, really, really tall, light, bright man and very even keeled, very calm, very patient man. And so, however... I was also choosing people who were also in the next vein, very verbally um, abusive. My mother was like that growing up. So I would choose this person who was a combination of the two of them. Mm. And so when you do the life timeline, you're able to pinpoint certain connections from the past and how it's showing up for you in the present. Mm. Because one of the things in the timeline that I noted was that whenever I had an issue come up with my father, I would note in the feelings category he made me feel safe because he was so calm. My mother was a firecracker. She was just over the top loud and just almost, you know, verbally abusive all the time. And so for me, I had to learn how to pinpoint what was going on. Got you. So as parents, we don't know sometimes that we're damaged and are Mm -hmm. scarred. And we don't, we suppose subconsciously don't know that we're like hurting our children. Mm -hmm. We think we're doing the right thing, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we're doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So as a parent, um, like I see things in myself that my mother did. Mm -hmm. um, And then sometimes I'm like, ah, that wasn't that good. That's popped off. I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always say to people, you quote me if I'm wrong, I was like, I could always tell a man that didn't have his father. Mm-hmm. Because he pops off like a woman. He's usually louder. Mm-hmm. Just because it's women to protect themselves because they weren't safe or maybe didn't have that. They, 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 they pop off. And mm-hmm. so, like, you witness that whenever she's angry, she's popping off. So, when I was younger, I could always see pop off. Um, and so, I also watched men who had their fathers and they tend to be like, hey, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's make sense Measured. of it. Give, give, give me one second. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was just something I started paying attention when I had to, like, uh, look at myself and understand, you know what I mean, like, some of my wrongdoings or, you know, even as a parent, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, so I say all that to say, though, um, I wanted to bring it back and say I didn't meet my father, right? Mm-hmm. I never met my father. Um, I never uh, – I, I got to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom wanted me to – I was born in Panama. He lives in Montreal. And when I was 18, before I turned 18, my mom was like, do you want a meeting? Mm-hmm. And I was just like, man, what the fuck for? Like, mm-hmm. shit. I, at this moment, I'm a state champion. I'm about to go to college with a track scholarship. Um, mm-hmm. I'm DJing. I'm making great money. I'm like, we figured it out without him. So what do we need him for? And But I think that as I got older, deep down inside, I just felt like th- that person, which mm-hmm. is the father, is supposed to love me. Mm-hmm. And so what, what I didn't know then that I do know now is that when somebody does something wrong to me, mm-hmm. I just shut down. Got it. And we could be in the same room and I, I won't speak to you because okay. you burnt me. Yeah. 
But I felt like nigga, you're supposed to love me. But mm-hmm. you, you my guy, and then you burn me. But I just shut down. I just won't even. I, I won't acknowledge you, right? Mm-hmm. And so I felt like that was my way of dealing with you in a cordial way because I did, I went popping off. Got it. But the truth is, mm-hmm. I that pain mm-hmm. from that situation. If I felt like you're supposed to treat me right with the same type of love that I gave you, when you burnt me, I now shut down on you as a friend. Yeah. And so um, I do that. Mm -hmm. That is a very transparent part of Eric. Yeah. Okay. How would you help me get through that? What were some steps or some tools or resources to where, okay, E, like, you might be right. He did do some effed up stuff to you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, know, the reaction is sometimes what you um, have to work on. And some people think because you popped off, that's the reaction. Mm -hmm. But silent treatment could also be a way of, Punishing those who did harm to you. Mm-hmm. What's the, what, what? How would you work work through that? So we would look at that and say, well, you know, is that silent treatment or stonewalling? Stonewalling. Right? Stonewalling could be like me and you were in the same room together, and I'm trying to talk to you, maybe get some answers out of you, and you're just kind of like, yeah, I don't really know. I, I don't know what to tell you. And you're just kind of not really giving real answers. You're just kind of avoiding the situation. So that would be like stonewalling. So. Whether we're talking about silent treatment or stonewalling, what's happening is internally, there's just almost like a rage that's going on. Facts. Right? And so you don't really feel safe enough. You don't really feel safe to express yourself because people like that are often just afraid of their own anger. Right? Because we're often told, I think, just as women first, I'll get to men, but as women, we're we're told sometimes like it's not cute to be angry. For men, right? I think you all get criticized so much in the media about who you are and toxic masculinity and how you show up. So and especially as a black man, for you to display your anger to somebody, it's like, oh, my God, I'm becoming that person. Right. So then it doesn't become safe for you to express that anger because then that person will really know the depth and breadth of what you're really feeling. Mm-hmm. And then you have to confront it because if you were ready to confront it in the first place, you would express it, but you're not ready to do so. So I would say, first of all, connecting to those feelings and recognizing that regardless of what the consequence well not regardless of what the consequences are but regardless of what you feel they're valid i always say this regardless of whether or not what you feel is valid or not it's valid like it's, it's whether or not it's true it's valid so let's just say you feel something happened that may not necessarily be factual it doesn't matter you feel what you feel so you have to first do the work of getting in touch with those feelings first of all i, I could i could say i i, I was hurt yeah, but what's the depth and breadth of that? Why would that have hurt you so much? What is the connection to... Because... What is the story that you tell yourself around what happened that breeds that um, pain? You know, in, in some partnerships, I feel like I've always been honest. Mm-hmm. I've been true to you. Uh, um, I've supported you, mm-hmm. however that may be, whether it's um, through physical uh, support, through um, being an ear as a friend during mm-hmm. a downtime. Uh, it could have been monetary. Uh, um, I've had I've had all those instances happen, right? Mm-hmm. And so I feel, you know, that I love you as a person, as an individual. And, and so um, I'm hurt because of maybe some uh, betrayal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I feel like, damn. And so like, you know, a person like me just kind of like recognize and just kind of back up. You know what I mean? So that's that's kind of like why I think I'm hurt. So my next question would be to you is, when was the first time that this hurt and betrayal landed for you in your life? So if I look at my father in this situation, it's, it's never ended. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's still to this day. So mm-hmm. my interaction with him was more so like... Uh, I went, to, uh, I went to Montreal. I, I learned I had some sisters. They found me on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew, but I just didn't know how to get to them. Mm-hmm. So they were, uh, this is like six, seven years ago. They they inboxed me for five years. And I, and I don't answer inboxes that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just seen the last name one time clearing out my stuff. Okay. And it was a three-year-old, two-year-old inbox. And I was like, damn, it looked like his name. And then I told my mom, and she was like, I think that's the daughter. So I reached out, and then the next day I went out to see them. It was cool. Spent a couple of days out there. And then they let me know that he had more kids. So I was like, man, how'd you figure that out? It was like, it was Halloween. They had moved and they had their faces painted when they answered the door. He had his face painted and the kid's face painted too. It was two boys. Mm-hmm. 
So they didn't know as they're interacting in the transaction of trick or treat. Mm. But then when he started talking, they said his name. Mm -hmm. He reacted. And then he realized that that was his daughters. Long story short, they realized that there was two boys. And then, you know, he was just kind of like walked his family away. So then when I got there, I asked for the phone number. Um, at this moment, I'm probably like mm, 33 years old. Like, yo, you know, like, I, I, I understand that I have uh, two brothers, two little brothers. Do you mind uh, meet me at like a Starbucks or something like that? Therefore, I can uh, meet him. And then he was just like, nah, that ain't going to really work. And you know what I mean? So... You know, I was just like, hey, I don't have any animosity towards you. I'm not here to really like, you know, solve any anything here. I just want to introduce myself and make myself available to, you know, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. You know, therefore they know that they have a big brother. Mm -hmm. um, and for me to be able to touch them, and, in touch with them and they be in touch with me. However that may work, I don't know. But I just want to be able to just introduce myself. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not here to cloud their minds or, or speak bad on you. I'm not here for that. And he was just like, nah, I ain't doing that. And I was just like, man, he's a bitch ass dude. So that's where the betrayal sat for you. Mm. Is in him not showing up as who you, in your mind, expected a father to show up as. Mm. And I think that for when we're talking about safe sex parents, safe, same sex parents, right? For children or for people who've had that experience, that's especially more intense because in a sense they become your blueprint. So now he's telling you, no, I don't want you a part as I don't want you to be a part of that part of my life. Mm -hmm. But you also have the dual message of, but this is also my father. This is not what a father is supposed to be. So that's where the betrayal comes from. And betrayal runs deep for people because there's a disconnect with what we thought is supposed to happen with what is actually happening. And your brain is kind of caught in this loop of trying to make sense of all of it, but it can't. So in not being able to make sense of it, we have anger that starts to develop as a result of that. So that makes sense that why you'd be so like afraid of the anger that's sitting within, because I noticed that you're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to show that it, like, I'd be pissed off if, if my father did that to me. Mm. So you kind of learned in that moment to kind of just Okay, well, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, meet them and show them that they have a big brother. You're trying to make it nice and safe. And he's like, no. Mm -hmm. So are you, so you've kind of, you, you had to learn almost how to not show up as the real version of you. Because I would think if you had permission to really go all out and show us what you were really feeling in that moment, you'd have showed us a hell of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's facts. Uh, that, I agree with do that. Do I know my stuff or do I know it? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. Now, so you, when you say, though, like you mm -hmm. show up as yourself, like that ain't always the best answer to do doing the right. That ain't that doesn't mean that's right either, though, right? What? Uh, you know, if I show up as myself in the sense of like, hey, bro, I ain't really trying to fuck with you. I'm just trying to get to the shorties and get to meet my peoples. You know what I mean? Like, uh, could ain't like a fucking punk. I mean, that's really, that's not the right way either, you know, but that's really the way I would address that. Is because I would, because I would be releasing some, that punk is it, it, really releasing well, like. But that's not, so I would even challenge and ask, is that still even an authentic statement? Because the reality is in an ideal situation, you would want to have that connection with him as well. Mm. So now you're reducing it to, well, I just want to talk to the kids, but really you still want a relationship with him. So when we talk about, when we talk about showing up as our authentic selves in these relationships, we often don't do that. So you've learned, again, to stonewall because you're not going to really show me the real you when you're upset. Because you've learned that when I show you, when I bear my heart to you, you, you don't me. show up for me. Uh. So in your relationships, when someone disappoints you, you shut down because you're like, well, you're not going to show up for me anyway. You're not going to understand where I'm coming from. So I'm going to just shut down and just leave this alone. Does Understood. That make sense? No, it does. It does. Now, I true, I true to heart believe I don't, I don't want a relationship. Mm -hmm. But I understand where it's hurt me. Yes. So, do you believe that when you hear that? I believe that your wise inner parent has come to the conclusion that it may not be safe for you or necessary for you to have a relationship right now. But your inner little boy might have wanted a relationship or might want a agreed. relationship with him. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. Got you, got you. So that little boy... Because that's, that's why I'm the dad I, that, I, that I was. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because I wasn't going to do no bum shit like that. Yeah. And a lot of the times we learn from what our parents did. So like my mother still struggles with, she's like, well, my mother did the best that she could, but she'll still engage somewhat in behavior that her mother did with me. And I'll say, that's not going to work. Like, don't do that with me. Right. Mm. So she's changed some things, but not all things. I know that for my kid, I'm never going to do certain things. I don't care what kind of pain I have to go through in order to make sure that doesn't happen, but it's just not going to happen. Right. Because we know we're connected to that inner little girl and a little boy that mm-hmm. felt that pain. So we're like, we're not going to do that to our kids all over again. So you have a wise inner parent that's showing up and making different decisions already. For example, when I worked in foster care, I'd have people when we interviewed the foster parents, they would say, oh yeah, I would still beat my kid with an extension cord. Context. You're talking to the, you know, to the director of training for a foster care agency and you're telling me, I'm interviewing you and you're telling me you would still whoop a foster kid who just got out of um, foster care with an extension cord. They were likely beaten with an extension cord. You want me to put one of our kids there? Mm. So self-awareness. They don't have the self-awareness to even say to themselves, I shouldn't even say that to her on this interview because I'm going to still whoop this kid's ass later on. They didn't, They couldn't even say that. They were just like, I would still do it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I would just say, mm, we're not going to place some our kids there. So when you have the awareness to be able to say, you know what? I went through this kind of feeling disconnected from my father. I don't want my kids to feel that way. So I'm going to do things differently. I may have my own struggles, but I want to have this different experience with my kids. Right? Mm. And we're not saying that you have to be perfect at it, but just enough self-awareness to say, I don't want my kids to experience that is enough for us to get on a journey to break certain generational curses or around generational trauma. That's fair. That's fair. Now, I'm going to give it a spin. So, how does narcissistic abuse affect us in the workplace? In the workplace? Yeah, like, you know, like, so, if we're going through some, like, bad times and, and manipulation mm-hmm. and all that type of stuff, you know, as an investor and a real estate investor, you know, and, and any entrepreneurs out there listening, like, how, how does... That affect us, you know, when we're going through the love bomb and we're trying to figure things out. We're going through that emotional roller coasters. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, what kind of side effects could could that, you know, spill into your business and affect your business? So, in terms of your business, it could just a myriad of ways. So, if we're talking about the workplace, if you really think about it, the workplace has a very similar setup as a as a parenting a parented household. There's your supervisor, CEO, mommy, daddy, right? Your coworkers are like your siblings. Right. So how you relate to each other can often feel like you're back home again. So if you have a boss that yells at you like your dad did, you're either going to have the very negative reaction of bawling them out and cursing them out or shutting down and, and not showing up for work again the next day or managing a silent, seething resentment for them as you go to work every single day. In terms of entrepreneurship, I definitely think it shows up in terms of our mindset. Um, Being an entrepreneur, you have to get comfortable with investing in yourself. If you've experienced narcissistic abuse, you've often received the message that you're not worthy of the investment. You're not worthy of being loved, seen, or valued. You have to value yourself and your business and what you're doing in order to feel like, I want to go pay $30,000 for this mastermind, right? I want to go pay $50,000 for this experience. And people struggle with that. They struggle with the mindset around that. You'll find entrepreneurs who are still very, you can see their inner little boy, inner little girl on display, whether it's online or just in person. I mean, at least for me, I'm able to see that. So I can see where someone's operating from. So for example, If someone experienced trauma, you know, at 12 or 13 years old, they'll language themselves as a 12 or 13 year old in response to you or just to other things that they Define that. What do you mean by language themselves? So one of the things that I, we were talking about this in another Facebook group. One of the things that I see online is like when we clap back at people online, right? Mm -hmm. And we shame them online because maybe they say something crazy to you in the comments, for example, or maybe you have a customer service issue and y'all are going back and forth in the DMs and you post it and you're like, oh my Mm -hmm. God. God, um, you know, this is what they say, and this is what I had to say to them. That's inner little girl, inner little boy stuff. Because the inner wise parent in you would just say, well, you know what? There's two sides to this. Let me resolve this in a way that's mature, that would still maintain my integrity, that would also put me in a, a friendly, hopefully 
professional light, you'll see a lot of people kind of do these clapbacks as businesses online. And you're like, that's so immature. But it really does come from the space of not having the maturity or the professionalism to be able to say, you know what, let me handle this privately because there's really no educational moment here outside of what my ego wants to display to the community. Does that make sense? No, 100 percent, 100 percent. Now, like. No, I ain't gonna go that way. (laughs) Well, I will. So I feel like. There's so much manipulation, especially in the African American culture, mm-hmm. um, because it, and I feel like it stems from like um, I like to use the analogy of a slave master, mm-hmm. um, and the way that the slave master operated and used us. I feel like a lot of that mm-hmm. continued to damage. Yeah, because the mom, we 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 do a lot of things by intimidating people, mm-hmm. and that comes from that. You know what I'm saying? And it's mm-hmm. like it's for example the slave master. Uh, beats you, doesn't give you shoes. You out there picking the cotton, getting the food. Mm-hmm. You came in to the tiki. You built the tiki. You cooked the food, and then he tells you some shit like, "I love you, Eric, for what you've done today." Mm-hmm. And then I say, "I love you too, Master." Mm-hmm. But the truth is, he don't love us for who we are. He loves us for what we done for him. Because yes. the minute you stop, you get whipped, you get hung. And so I feel like that is the narrative of narcissistic abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also there's just so much to go into it. We're afraid to leave because mm-hmm. we became dependent mm-hmm. because of the person. Slaves, some slaves stayed when they were, when we were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we stay, but we created this whole motherfucker, mm-hmm. but we're afraid to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so that's my analogy then that I go to, um, where I tell people that, some of the most manipulative people are, are your mom and your dad. And they use the word mom and dad to manipulate you. I often say that our parents were our first bullies. Mm. Mm-hmm. Why? Because if you really think about it, um, one of the things I always say, like, shut up or I give you something to cry about, right? If the kids are already crying, they're already crying. You're gaslighting them in that moment. You're telling them that in that moment, you know, what you're upset about isn't worth it. Shut the hell up right now because I don't want to hear it. So you tell that person that they're not worthy of being being seen or heard in terms of what's upsetting them. When someone gets bullied at school, right? So I've had clients where they've told me that, you know, they've had kids hold their head down and flush a toilet with their head inside the toilet bowl while they're pissing on them, Right. And so when you think about it, abuse is abuse. It really it's re- it really comes down to the feeling of shame, right? And low self-worth when someone does that to you. So you've got mom at home telling you, shut up or I'll give you something to cry about because you talk too much, right? In school, the teacher may say you talk too much. You came home with like a a red day. Like, you know, kids get the dots um, in their cards when they come home from school. And your parents are like, well, what happened? You was talking too much. No, I wasn't talking too much. Shut up. Go to your room, right? And shut up before I give you something to cry about. But really, the kid was getting bullied and trying to communicate that to the teacher. But the teacher's not listening. The teacher doesn't have time. So no one's really hearing them. They grow up in relationships and choose people who are a combination of the teacher and the parent who never listened to them, but is steady abusing them. Do you see how that works? Mm-hmm. So that's how that shows up in our relationships. Wow. Gotcha. That's deep. That's deep. Now, you have this awesome community of a few mm-hmm. thousand people um, meeting up. Um, tell us about it. So I have, so on Instagram, I probably have at this point over 100,000 people. Um, it's termed, in terms of followers, in terms of our membership, the Inner Circle membership, we have almost 2,000 women in that program. It's a oh. monthly membership. I like to think of it as like the Netflix for healing after toxic relationships. So these are women who, we got started during COVID, right? And so during that, I didn't know COVID obviously was going to start. But these are women who lost their health insurance because they no longer had access to, you know, a job that would give them health insurance. They, they may also be women who just 
couldn't afford to go in to see a psychotherapist or just didn't really, they weren't really warmed up with the idea of meeting with someone one-on-one. But they know that they've been engaged in some kind of messy patterns and Mm -hmm. they just needed a way to be able to come in and engage with the work in a self-paced way. So I create one new masterclass every single month. It's coupled with with videos, it's coupled with workbooks, and then we also have a live workshop at the end of the month to talk about everything that they've learned. Gotcha. Do you speak, do you take a specific subject or do you, you know? Any subject relating to this. So for example, inner child healing, trauma bonds, right? Which is where you're in a really abusive relationship we feel like you can't let go um we've done classes around the core wounds of abandonment and rejection um this month we're doing part two healing after hidden abuse um last month was recovering after covert emotional abuse so we have topics that relate to relational trauma every single month got you now we're in a mastermind so i know you got some projects coming what kind of projects and uh things you got coming for the people that are looking for support. So being that we're in the mastermind, one of the things I had to really process was how can I take my members on a journey, right? My goal for a really long time was just to have a membership. So now as my members have graduated, we just hit our one year anniversary back in January of this year. So now I want to, thank you. So now I want to take them on a journey afterwards. So now a lot of them are ready to date again, but they want to know how to do so in a healthy way. So to that end, we created a program called Healing Me After We, right? And then after that, we have another group mentorship experience, which is going to open up probably in September of this year, if not earlier. And so that is an eight-week group mentorship program where we're literally teaching you how to live your best life. Because the reality is after going through relational trauma, some women are not, some women may be in relationships, they may not be in relationships, but because they've been so externally focused on being in a relationship and other people in their life, they need to get back to themselves, the Mm. healthy version of themselves. So our tagline is I help what my tagline is generally that I help women heal up the toxic relationships so that they can become the best version of themselves. So in the new group mentorship program, we're helping you become the best version of yourself. So whether that looks like in your relationships, it looks like work, career, business, entrepreneurship, whatever that looks like for you, we're going to help you uncover the path to help you get there. Got you. Got you. Okay. Now we're going to leave the link below the video for them to get a hold of you. Yes. All yes. right, cool, 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 cool. So make sure that you do that. Hit the link below. Get with Ginger on Instagram. Yep, you, loving me after we. All right, there it is. There it is. Now, I do have a question. Have you ever been married? Yes, I have. Oh, I didn't know that about you. You, you didn't know that yet? No, no. Yeah. You ain't wearing that ring. Where he at? <laughs> <laughs> we divorced. Oh, how was that? Are you open to talk about that yeah, first of all? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So we got divorced about eight years ago now. Gotcha. Right? How long were you married? We were married about seven years, six, seven years. Oh, that's pretty lengthy. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. So you was being toxic then? I'm A pretty little bit. sure I had some toxic patterns. Yeah. It wasn't all him. We were young and dumb. We got married when we were like 25. Yeah, that was a great answer. You did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did a good job. You didn't expect me to come no, no, to no, it, did you? No, 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 no. You did a good job. Okay. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. So... Um, what did you learn about yourself in this experience? I learned that I picked someone who was reminiscent of all the abuse that I'd been through growing up. Mm. And I was more wedded to the idea of marriage and love than I was really to the idea that this needed to be someone who was truly for me, truly connected to me. And in that situation, you know, in hindsight, you just kind of learned that you get, I got married because of all the social pressures. I was 25. And one of our, our things where we would tell people, is like, yeah, you know, we graduated college, um, we got married, we bought the house. We did all the socially expected things that we were supposed to do, right, financially, um, marriage-wise. The next thing was, when y'all going to have some kids? And it was just like, X pump breaks, right? Mm. So I learned that I had some inner little girl stuff. I had some trauma bonding stuff going on as well. I had some, you know, abandonment and rejection issues because truly— the marriage should never have happened in the first place. But I think that it needed to happen and it needed to end for me to get to where I am today. Mm. Because had I not gone through that experience, I would not be the woman I am today. And I know a lot of women will say, well, you know, I exit all these other things to me. I'm not saying that it needed to happen to you. I'm saying that in my experience, I would not be where I am right now 
had that not situation unfolded the way that it did. Y'all cool today? No, we're not cool today. Guys, it's probably no. your fault. What? It's probably your fault. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, it's probably your fault. Like, like we're not taking the L. City boys, we up 5,000. <laughs> All right. So, um, going through that divorce, um, did it affect you um, emotionally a lot? Or you kind of went through it because you, you just, you said that you learned a lot and you knew it wasn't for you. So, was it easy? Or would you say, deem it as uh, something that was challenging for you? I would say 18 months before we actually divorced, I was like, this marriage should have never started. So I had already prepared emotionally that we were not going to, like, we were going through therapy. We had friends who were married couples, you know, talking to us, counseling us too. We had the church involved too. And it was a lot. And I think for me, I ultimately started to realize a therapist, one of our, well, the, the couples therapist said to me, she goes, this is a narcissist and you are going to have to make significant shifts in yourself in order to accommodate this marriage. And she said, I can't even recommend that you do so. Mm. And I was just like, what? And I was actually angry at her when she said that to me. And then today I look back and I think to myself, my God, like she was right. Right. And so ultimately I had already reasoned within myself that the marriage should not have happened and that it will probably end. But of course, when you're married, you're trying to do everything that you can to see if it's going to work. So when we got divorced, I didn't have this like despair, despair, with gloom it was just kind of like I'm ready for I was ready for this to be done mm. yeah. so since you know everything oh lord <laughs> how easy how easy is it for you to date how easy is it for me to date I would say I date differently now because I'm able to pick up on things I think that because you know everything no because I you see think you know everything just admit it. well fine I know everything there Eric. is okay, good job hey. <laughs> yes 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 you think you know everything all right so uh huh. You were saying. I don't engage in consequential shit when it comes to dating, for example. People will say, well, you don't have kids? No, I don't have kids. Oh, you're a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, I'm a successful entrepreneur. Like, I don't engage in shit that I'm going to really look back and say, oh, fuck, the divorce was enough for me. That whole situation for me was enough for me to say to myself, you know what? I want to do things differently moving forward. And even then, I still messed up after that, right? So now I look at it and I say to myself, well, if I'm going to date someone, I have to be honest with myself, right? I can't engage in certain things with people that I know we're not on the same page. If we're not on the same page, what's the point? I've been down that road before where... You know, you date someone and you kind of like pretend like you're on the same page, but you kind of really know that you're not. So what's the whole point? You just kind of keep your head down and you continue working on yourself until you get to a place where you meet someone. And if it works, it works. If not, it not. If not, it, then it just doesn't. Now, do you think that um, the more success you obtain as an entrepreneur, the harder it becomes to date? I definitely think so. I was talking to another girl in our mastermind about that. See, I'm smart and you don't know everything. <laughs> Eric, school saying, me, school um, me. So, so I mean, you said that, uh -huh. so that triggered that that thought in the sense of, you know, um, it's hard. The more success you have financially and mentally, we're stimulated at a different level, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even Jackson after the last podcast was just like, I told him when he entered the internship, like you about to be like, fuck this job. <laughs> Like in the sense of you're going to become an entrepreneur sometime. You're going to test it. You want you're, him to. Yeah. yeah, out the gate. And I told him that. And, I, and then, you know, transparently he told the prior um, interview that, like, yeah, I've been considering it more. Like my life, like, yes, I think differently, yeah. which is super dope. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about engaging with somebody and they're not on the same page. Yeah. I mean, you can't knock them if they're not, if they're, if, if they're, if, first of all, being an entrepreneur, you're not always right. It's not for everybody. Um, and, and it's okay to be a have a job. It's great. You got you have security, right? But it's just a different path. Yes. It's a different path yes. to the success and success is different different people. We think differently. Yep. So I say that to then come back to your statement, you know, that could get challenging because meeting men that are successful at your level mm -hmm. um that can challenge you, not in the mm -hmm. sense of like that, but in the sense of stimulate higher level uh thinking. And, and keep you engaged with them, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what I've found is entrepreneurs on our level are easier to deal with ooh. than 
for example, someone who uh, is intimidated, and I know a lot of people say, well, they're just not intimidated, but you meet some men and they'll say, oh my God, like, you know, you're beautiful, you're feminine, you're, you're sweet and you do all these different things, but I can't get past the fact that you make so much more money than I do. That's weak. And their egos are just like, atta- they feel like they're used to the imbalanced power dynamic. I can't wait to uh, have a sugar mama. Like <laughs> lock down, take care of my shit, pay my mortgage. Like, you, you don't even never. got car payments. I got two. You don't even got car payments. So like, Eric, I'm talking to you. You, you know who never. you are. You are at home. Like, it's okay. <laughs> take care of that shit. I'm, I have no pride. We got more vacations. You hear me? <laughs> like, I'm so cool with that. Have, but you know what, though? You you are already at a place in your life where you're just like, with or without her, I'm good. Right? She doesn't make me her. If you meet, if you met someone that made five times the money that you do. You're still balling. You're still I doing. I don't. I don't, I don't care about the yeah, money, really, right? Exactly. But when someone's making seventy thousand dollars and you make ten times what they make, as a man who's being told in society that he should be the breadwinner, mm-hmm. and he's dating someone who makes exponentially more money than he does, then what? What does he do with that? Unless yeah, you got to level her own, up, right? True, and unless he's done his own inner work to be able to say, I'm going to level up and not take it out on her, Mm. what he does then is take it out on her. So I've had someone say to me, I think you should own cleaning the house. And I said, well, I don't want to do minimum wage activities in my house. I'm going to pay somebody. So I have a, I just bought a house. So I said, yeah, I have a woman that comes to clean the house weekly, right? Mm. I work from home and I have her come clean my house because it's some shit I don't want to do. Mm. Well, I, think I got a cleaner too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's some shit I think that I don't want to do anymore at this level. Well, I think you should be on your knees cleaning the toilets. And I was like, okay, well, we're just probably not for each other. Then right? you had a discussion for real? Yeah, for real, we had that discussion. I was just like, yeah, no, I'm good. There's certain things I'm just not going to do. Like, mm. who fantasizes cleaning toilets? Mm. I don't really want to do that. I could dig it. Now that you talk about your crib, you know what I'm saying? Like, how how how's the the move done? Complete? You in there? Yeah, I'm probably about eighty five percent unpacked. I still have some things. Man, I hate moving. That's I the do. worst. Yeah, especially moving from DC down here. You're just like gotcha. Oh. So moving down here, how uh, how did you find your home? I had the greatest uh, realtor, Kiana Watson. She's okay. my realtor. Got gotcha. you. Is she working with? Um, Marvin? I don't know. She might be. Okay, because I, I think I met her. When, uh, I was down here for Shan's podcast. I think I met her. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I, think I, I think she introduced herself because I was looking she for She was here like, the week that yeah, he was Marvin here. was here. Oh, okay. 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 Yep, because I was actually um, looking to invest in some Airbnbs maybe um, for oh, me to come down okay. and have a place to stay. Sense now. Okay, that makes sense now. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah he was actually house shopping, I think, mm-hmm. um, when he came down here. Mm-hmm. Got you. So... We had a conversation once. You was looking at houses in Buffalo. Yes, I was. Got you. Yes. Do you own any real estate outside of your personal home? No, not anymore. I sold them. Got you. Yeah. So you, so you, you actually invest in rental, real estate before? Yes, yes, we did. Yep, me and my ex-husband did. Got you. How many rentals did you have? We were just one at the time. Got you. Yeah. Okay, okay. And you looking to do it again? Yes. Why? Because I love the passive income of a buy and hold and being able to find like a good property management company. So, for example, I was a part of a real estate investing investing group in Buffalo. But one of the issues in Buffalo, well, in Rochester, let me say, um, was finding a really professional and reputable property management company for mm. owners that are living outside of Rochester. That was a big issue. So the person that we had set up to move forward with to manage the properties that we were going to buy stole every stole some people's money and the rest mm. of the group so we were just like eh, that's something that i would want to have set up first because in buff in sorry in rochester in comparison to the price of a multifamily, the section eight rents it's it's great great return it's awesome so like on a fifty thousand dollar five unit multifamily, they're paying fifteen hundred dollars a month where do you find that you gonna find that? Yeah, that's, 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 Is that's that, do, do they do that where you are? Nah, nah, okay. nah. It's gonna cost a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, right? So I was just like, $50,000? I mean, that's nothing for a five. No, not at all. Now, now, my question to you at the time was, what does it look like? And, and I showed you some pictures. Yeah, yeah. Now, they're not the most. 
prestige, but it's no, livable. But it's, it's livable, yes. And they're, and they're turnkey. Yes. And um, Section 8 makes sure with the certificate of occupancy, like that everything is what it's supposed to be, right? It's not pretty, but it's livable. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, the passion behind that. It's not pretty. It's not it's not what? pretty. I pro- you know, it's not pretty. Got you. Do you have goals around real estate that you want to achieve? Yes, I would love to have a portfolio of rentals. I remember when we spoke, um, I want to say in, in Orlando, I always say this to, I think I said it to Courtney. I was like, that man told me, look, Ginger, for your peace of mind, just get you some buy and hold and call it a day. You don't want to deal with the rest of the shit. Because you because you do flips, right? I do I do flips and rentals. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And you were like, don't even do this. Like, just get you a buy and hold and just cut the drama. And I was like, Okay, yeah. because I was never really interested in flips anyway. But when you said it like that, I was like, "Yeah, I probably just because you, you gotta look at it like this, right?" So um, when investors um, invest and they have income already, I have to let them know that they have to. Our, one of our duties as entrepreneurs is to manage the velocity of our our funds. Mm-hmm. So where we invest, we need to actually invest where we get the the highest velocity. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you buy a flip. And you only make twenty five thousand dollars, and it took you five months to do that project. In essence, you only made five thousand mm-hmm. dollars per month. Mm-hmm. You could probably do that at your job. Mm-hmm. Therefore, that's not probably the best investment for you. Mm-hmm. You need to go somewhere where that same investment uh, that you made can turn fifty thousand dollars in five months. Now you're making ten thousand. Now the velocity of your ROI is increased. So when I knew that you had a course that you were creating. Focus more on your course than on a flip because the yes. flip is going to take your time and it's going to slow down the velocity of your return on your course, you know, and everything yeah, that you're, you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Now, passive income through rental properties, you're trying to do that for the long run. Mm-hmm. So my advice would be every $30,000 you get or so, mm-hmm. put a down That's payment insane. of $20,000 on a rental property. Yeah. Boom. Therefore, over the years, as you accumulate capital from your coursework, then you could invest it, and that's building up for you. Mm-hmm. By the time that you're ready to retire, hopefully you have 15, 30 rental properties, and now you have a cash flow. Mm-hmm. On top of that, you have equity out there. Mm-hmm. And not to add, we just talked about your business, and you, we talked about lending. Not to put all your business out there, but banks have a special relationship with real estate. Yes. Because it's an asset that they could leverage mm-hmm. to lend on. Mm-hmm. And if you have a portfolio mm-hmm. of rental properties with equity, you can leverage that portfolio to then basically fuel your course, yeah, uh, um, your, your courses and everything else that you want to do. Mm-hmm. So that's why I advise just get your rental properties, boom, and then turn, it'll turn around and then fuel everything else you want to do exactly. because you have collateral that they can leverage to then get more money mm-hmm. to make more money. Yes. You know? Yep, that's the plan. So that's, that's cool. You still going to look in Buffalo? Because we need to go to look in Buffalo well, together. I told myself I was going to take you to Buffalo with oh, There it is. There okay. it is. You know so what I'm saying? I, I, it, so I got I got some uh, I got some requests, though. Uh-huh. I don't do Spirit or Frontier flights. I like first class. I already know Delta first class. There it is. You know, know what I'm saying? As long as you know, know. we good. You know I already saying? calculated this in my mind. Like, <laughs> this is what he's going to want. <laughs> my, my hotels, hotels could be cool. Like, you know what I mean? They got to do nothing. Rochester. There it is. It's not going to be. Yeah, it's cool. Okay. Like, I'm cool with the hotels. It's just the point. I got to be comfortable. You okay. know what I mean? Me and Jackson was in some like messed up situations yesterday. I, I just, I just that ain't my lifestyle right there, man. Wait, was Jackson here when y'all were in the other Airbnb? Yeah, he was in the hood. He was at the boys in the hood. I'm so sorry you had to experience Hey, that. Jackson GD, GD. Like, he cool, though. He, you know what I'm saying? He's Southside Chicago GD. Don't trip. <laughs> I said you have that man down there. Yeah, yeah. We was getting oh, it in. Man. By any means necessary, we will podcast and interview dope people that do dope things and basically, you know, find out the relationship to real estate they got so we know that Ginger in the next few years should be acquiring a couple rental properties. Next year, sir, next year. Got you. Now, remember what I told you, and I'll share this with the people. I showed you the compound effect. Yes. Um, And the compound effect was, I showed her if she got 10 rental properties and the profits, let's just say they were $3,000 per um, property, Mm -hmm. um, $300 per property, if you took the profits and put them on the first property that you got, Mm you'll be putting down $3,000 Every month, yeah. depending on the price of the property, you could pay that off in let's say twenty four to thirty six months. But with the same equation, 
being able to compound those payments down onto the first home. You'll be able to pay down those homes and it'll get quicker and quicker and quicker as you pay them off because you have more capital to put down on the home. If you did that, you should be able to pay down home, pay all those homes off in 11 years. Mm -hmm. And now, let's say that portfolio, let's say that portfolio was worth um 3 million. Mm -hmm. Now, the pay the, the tenants have paid for $3 million portfolio that you own free and clear. Mm -hmm. But the trick is this. Mm -hmm. You could refinance refinance all those houses at 75% yeah. to ARV and pull out $2.25 million minus the fees. Yeah. Now you could get your apartment building. Yes. Yes. And so that's how you really um, leverage it. real estate mm -hmm. to, you know, Pursue your dreams um, in your course, all the trips that you got to take me on to go look at some more real estate to uh -huh. invest in and all that type of stuff. I think one of the things I'm going to end up talking to you about is like all the hot spots, right? Hot spots. Like, we can talk about that Like now. all that, like, like for me, Rochester, like when I really started to take a look at that area and I was like, well, why is the price, why are the prices in relation to Section 8? I mean, it's great for an investor, right. but I was just like, wow, they pay a lot for Section 8 up there. So what I would do is thank you for telling my people that. Okay. <laughs> Don't buy everything up now. Now, the one thing I would say is this, though. Let, let's talk about that. So um, I've, I've said it before, but like I would call like the hot zones, mm -hmm. meaning like the more expensive areas, obviously the shore. Mm -hmm. You know, the New Yorks, the the Miamis, the LAs, San Diego's, everything mm -hmm. on the shore is pretty expensive. So I would, I would make that red. And then you got your like warm areas like the South Carolinas, the Carolinas. Um, we got Atlanta. It's really actually hot. Um, and then you have the Midwest. Mm -hmm. that I, would, I would call that more green, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that it's cheaper real estate. Um, so I would say that when you look at hot areas, you need to look at like places like Memphis. Yeah. That's a hub for like FedEx. UPS mm -hmm. is the crossroads of America in essence. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the blue collar workers These are always uh, buy and hold. Mm -hmm. Buy and hold. It's going to be more affordable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, you're going to be able to find homes under $200,000. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, those people make, you know, the, the average income is of maybe $40,000. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're not typically homeowners at that price point. Mm -hmm. And with the price of homes going up, they're not going to have the ability to purchase homes with that salary. Yeah. Therefore, that's where you'll have an advantage is by a whole investor. Yeah. Indianapolis, uh, Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. Cincinnati. Uh, I wouldn't go to Chicago. Chicago's expensive. I'll call that more of a red. Um, but Midwest, St. Louis is is just is just the bulk of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to go to appreciate markets, you go to Houston. You go to Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because a lot of people are moving from Cali to Dallas and Houston okay. because there's more land. Mm -hmm. And then with COVID, tech companies are working abroad. Okay. Therefore, like the real estate is appreciating in those areas because so many people are moving there. Yeah. Therefore, if the demand is up, there's more competition for the homes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you're a buy and hold investor, mm -hmm. the truth is as prices for homes and people compete for homes, mm -hmm. your ARV, your after repair value is going to keep going up. Yeah. And you're going to be able to refinance and get lumps of of cash. Okay. So that's those are the markets that I would say to tap in. If you're going to invest, I was not familiar with the area that you, uh, uh, Rochester, that you told me about. But Midwest is definitely like, this is crazy easy yeah. in the sense of finding homes under $200,000. Yeah. Um, and I do believe that investors on the edges aren't going to be spending two, a, a million, $2 million on flips. Yeah. They're going to come into the middle. Therefore, the appreciation for buying whole investors is going to be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of good things to think about. Yeah, yeah. So that's the nuggets for today, man. Thank I want to I appreciate you for coming through, break it down, some psychology, uh <laughs> coaching me up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. And, and hey man, you was like, you was dumping info on us, man. <laughs> that was wild. Well, we learned something, man. Thank you. Where You're could the people find you one more time? I, I'm primarily on IG. Okay. At Loving Me After We. Um, if you want to visit my website, you can always visit me at lovingmeafterwe.com. And if you're interested in joining the Inner Circle membership, it's going to be lovingmeafterwe.com slash join. We will drop the link below for the mentorship once we launch. Got you, got you. If you need some help, it's okay. I need some help, obviously. So I, I need to go ahead and click the button too. I want to thank you for, man, 
watching another episode of First Generation Wealth Builders. I really, really do appreciate your support. Make sure to tell a friend to tell a friend to tap in and, you know, listen to some dope stories and learn some dope stuff. And also get your sprinkle of real estate in there, man. I'll see you next time.